All right, well, Psalm 112 this evening. Psalm 112, before we get into our, our time of prayer. Remember, uh, we said last week that Psalm 111 and 112 and 113 go together. But even more specifically, Psalm 111 and 112, as they are complementary texts. Don't know if you were here last week, but Psalm 111 and Psalm 112 are complementary passages. Um, whether they were written together and divided, or they are so similar in the theme that the writer, uh, or that the compilers, of, excuse me, of the scriptures put them side by side, we're not exactly sure. Um, I tend to think that they were written together, and they are intended to be taught and sung together. Um, Remember, two things about these passages, or one thing about these two passages is they're both acrostic texts. In other words, each, um, each letter in the Hebrew, obviously it doesn't translate to our English translation, but in the Hebrew, each letter begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, so it's an acrostic text. So that's one way in which they're similar. And then the other similarity is just the major theology of the passage. They're both wisdom psalms, um, but Psalm 111 introduces... Psalm 112, um, in the very last verse of verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding, and his praise endures forever. And so this, this concept of the Lord's praise and this concept of wisdom in Psalm 11, 111 introduces for us Psalm 112. Uh, keeping these things in mind, I have a question for you. How many of you have ever gone off the beaten path on maybe a road trip or a journey or you were driving? How many of you, when you pull out your, you know, your, your GPS, GPS users, right? Yeah, you get your iPhone going or your smartphone going, and you look through the routes and you choose which route you're going to take. And, and sometimes you may actually, and maybe you don't, so an option you have is actually to sacrifice a few minutes if you feel like it's going to be an easier drive. I will do that. If it's a difference of 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to pick the easier drive, the, the lower stress drive. Uh, but you have the option to choose different routes. I remember um, last year when we were going to um, uh, Gatlinburg for family vacation, um, we went for just a few days and... Um, so there's a route that takes you, it's mostly highway south, and, uh, and then you get into Tennessee, and I thought, oh, there's, some, there's a throughway here, and it'll save us some time, right? And it looked easier, and, uh, and so, John, I, don't, I don't remember what it was, I don't remember what road it was, or it was one of those little small, you know, southern highways, and so I got on it, and it was, uh, and we're going, and we're going, and we're going, and it's getting increasingly more rugged, you know? And, and the towns are starting to look uh, less civilized. <laughs> um, like, and I don't mean that as in like, you know, a knock, as in like, is there actually civilization here? You know, are... <laughs> no, we weren't there yet, but Hazard, Kentucky sounds like a place that would fit that description. <laughs> Any place that's called hazard, I would say stay away from it. Um, but so, so we get, and we're going 55 because it's one of these little, you know, high throughways. And so we come up on this town. And again, when I say town, I mean like there's McDonald's and Shoney's and Waffle House and like a food line, right? And that's it. And, uh, and so we're going and police officers pull out and they block the highway. And about 10 guys... You know, we're backwards Tennessee at this point. Okay, so about 10 guys, they get out, and they've got a rope, and they've got a banner attached to a rope. And they're going to put this banner up on this railroad overpass. And so the whole road gets blocked down so they can stick their, you know, their banner up on this railroad overpass. And, um, and once they got it up, it said, welcome, and it was spray painted. And it was like, thank you? <laughs> like, what, what a classy welcome, I guess, right? Uh, Tell you all that to say, maybe you have a very similar experience to that, you know, um, 
there's a lot of strange towns, strange roads, and strange routes. Uh, all that just to, to say, um, perhaps you've, you've experienced a road less traveled in your life, and you've realized you, you shouldn't have taken the road less traveled. There's a reason there's some roads are more traveled. Well, in Psalm 112, it's, it's like much of the scripture in that it presents wisdom as a direction, the way of wisdom. And you find that this is the road less traveled that you should take. Jesus uses terminology similar to this. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. There's a lot of traffic on that road. But narrow is the the way to heaven. Narrow is the way to the kingdom. It seems increasingly that wisdom is the road less traveled. In culture and in the world that we live today, and not just in our, our culture, but if you look around the world, and you know, you could get really discouraging with it, but if you look around the world, the world is getting worse. Cultures are getting more sinful. I mean, I, you, have to, you have to, you know, be, be a, a part of a very niche sect of theology that says, no, the world's getting better. The world is getting palpably worse. And wisdom is becoming the road less traveled. There's not a lot of traffic on this road. But the people of God are to stay following the road, the way of wisdom, as the Scriptures presented to us. And as we follow this road, we know that there are certain markers along this road. There are guardrails along this road that keep security, that keep safety, And we find that this is not only a way that we should go, but really the only way that we should go. Let's read the psalm. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. He will remember. He is not afraid of bad news, but his heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to see clearly the safety that is in the way of wisdom, the security, the certainty, and the insecurity and danger of turning away, turning aside. I pray that you would cause us to perceive clearly the way of wisdom tonight, to teach it well, to those whom you have entrusted to us in our lives and to follow after it ourselves. God, would you help me as I teach your word and would you help the listener as they receive? And I ask these things in Christ's name, amen. Well, Psalm 111 and 112, as we've said, go together. Psalm 111 praises God for his works. We saw that very plainly. We saw that very clearly last week. Even just note the first few verses of Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Um, In the company of the upright in the congregation, great are the works of the Lord. Verse 3, splendor in his majesty is his work. Verse 7, the works of his hands are faithful. His precepts are 
trustworthy. So you get the idea that very clearly we're supposed to praise the Lord for His works. The Psalm, Psalm 112 begins the same way as does Psalm 113, praise the Lord. So the opening of each psalm also provides or adds to this complementary nature. And so that's where the psalmist begins here is worship. But then he immediately moves to the other pervasive concept of the text or the primary concept of the text, which is the concept of wisdom or God's way, walking in God's way, the way of wisdom. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandment. So note with me in verse 1, the introduction to the whole psalm, worship and wisdom. Worship and wisdom. We are praising Yahweh together. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Remember, uh, as Solomon tells us in chapter 1 of Proverbs, it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. So the concept of the fear of the Lord and wisdom are seen synonymously in the poetic books. They go together. This reverential awe that we have for God allows us to both have access and understanding to this wisdom, causes us to better understand the source of this wisdom. Blessed or happy is the man who <clears throat> fears the Lord, has honor for the Lord, and who greatly delights in his commandments. So what's the source of this wisdom? Where are we going to receive this wisdom? The word of God. The commandments here are, the word commandments here is really just the, the word that's, that's used to communicate the, the counsel of God or the truth of God or the, the word of God. Blesses the man who fears the Lord. So that's the aspect of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We will not attain or pursue this wisdom without a proper reverence for God. And, and I'm going to say from the very outset by way of application that I think within Christian circles and within Christian atmosphere, that is the primary reason for Christians lacking wisdom is because they lack all. Okay? We're, we're not going to get to the wisdom of God without the fear of God. And I think there are way too many Christians who want to have an instructional view of God's Word. That is, they want some way to navigate life, or they want wisdom, but they really don't have a big view of God. Therefore, they really don't fear God. They really don't honor God. They don't have an awe for God. And I'm actually going to add to that even a little bit further and say that I think the entertainment culture within churches has really contributed to this lack of awe of God. That you go to church to be pumped up and amped up, and we're going to do it with lights, or we're going to do it with music, we're going to do it with smoke, we're going to do it with whatever effects that we have. And again, all of those things in and of themselves categorically aren't bad. But what's your goal and what are you trying to accomplish? And if you're just trying to get people there and entertained and feel good about themselves and go home, what you've just perpetuated is, a, is an internal, amped up view of God that's not really rooted in truth. And so... I think in many ways, people are Christians are trying to jump the gun on wisdom. They want the wisdom, but they have no awe. They have no reverence. They have no fear of God. And maybe that's because we don't really like the idea of a God that we have some sort of healthy fear for. And of course, you understand when we talk about fear here, we're not saying we're running or fleeing from God. It's more the idea that we're falling before him. We understand who he is in relation to who we are, and we recognize that he's worthy of our honor. And so I think church culture, church culture and Christian culture needs to represent that. I think there needs to be a, an awe of God that even shows in the fruits of our choices and the culture of our churches. Worship and wisdom. So from the very outset, we need to make sure that we're oriented to fearing God or his wisdom will be inaccessible to us. So it's easy to talk about what's out there and the church culture that's out there. And we're even a conservative church, but how's your view of God? How much reverence do you have towards God? We love a God that loves, and we should. We should praise God for that. We... we Love a God who's abundant in kindness and has, to use Paul's terms, which I just love so much, 
made us rich with the riches of His grace. I mean, how good is that, right? We love all those things. We love the, you know, the, the repeated phrase in the psalmist, he inclines his ear. He's like a father who bends down and gets on one knee and talks to us at our level. We love all that, but what about, I was just thinking about, because I'm thinking down the road in our Ephesians series, and we're wrestling against flesh and blood, so I was thinking today about you know, visions of God, and I was thinking about when Daniel gets tapped in the shoulder by Michael, right? The archangel, or Gabriel. He says, hey, I was on my way over here, but I got waylaid in the spiritual battles. And, and so it really slowed me down because I was fighting the cosmic war. I mean, I mean. And, and what about the prophets who saw visions of God that just caused them to hit the ground? What about the God that when he sends his final judgment through Christ, because what does the apostle say? It's that Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. They're going to go hide in the rocks to escape his judgment. And the rocks themselves will turn on them. What about that God? I think, I think we have a lack of reverence because we have an imbalance in our theology. We pick and choose which God we want rather than the God that is. And I, I believe I've said it. I believe I've said it, but one of the things that I think is really important for those who teach the Word and those who are active disciple-makers and pastors is to help people grow comfortable with a God who isn't always comfortable. He's good, but he's not safe. It's a steal from Lewis. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man. Happy is the man who fears the Lord. I mean, just look at that balance. There's just so much in this one, this one verse. Happy is the man who fears the Lord. So clearly fear is not a negative thing here. It brings delight. Happy, blessed is the man. So then the psalmist is going to flesh out these concepts of wisdom. What does this wisdom bring? What, what, is, what happens to this man who fears the Lord? What are the characteristics of his life? What are the blessings of his life? And they're very, they're, I mean, they're very apparent. Verses 2 to 5, it's, it's obvious that the first aspect of, that this blessed man endure, enjoys is prosperity. Prosperity. So, verse 1, worship and wisdom, verses 2 through 5, he's brought prosperity. Now, you know, um, be careful, but look, his offspring will be mighty in the land. It's going to go well for his children. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Okay, so they're not just going to be mighty, they're going to be happy too. Same word, happy or blessed. Generationally, things will go well for the wise man. Now, again, I think it's important that I say this, especially in light of all the parenting conversations that we've had. It's really important you understand this. Um, Poetic books do not, on the whole, especially Proverbs, uh, let me say it this way. When you read the poetic books, you need to be certain when you are working with a promise and when you are working with a principle or a probability. There are some times in the poetic books what you're reading is a promise. There are other times what you're reading is a principle or a probability. Psalm 111, verse 5, he remembers his covenant forever. Promise or principle? Promise. Um, Psalm 139. If you ascend into heaven, he's there. If you make your bed in hell, he's there. He's he's there with you. Promise or principle? Promise. Proverbs. And I can't remember the chapter. Um, If you do, help me out. Um, Instruct your child in the way that he should go, and he will not depart from it. 
Promise or principle? Principle. You've all known somebody, and maybe you yourself, were not perfect, but you were faithful as a parent, and your child's not walking with the Lord. Okay. We are working here with probabilities. Just because you're faithful does not mean you'll make a lot of money. <laughs> does not mean your barns are going to be full. Look, look, at the, look at the next few verses. Wealth and riches are in his house and righteousness endures forever. I am not perfect by any means. I am so far from it. <laughs> but I'm doing my best to live for the Lord. I mean, and I think you'd say the same thing. You're not perfect, but you're doing your best to live for the Lord. You're doing your best to walk in the way of wisdom. And I can just tell you, my house is not overflowing with gold. <laughs> and if it were, I'd love to share it with you. But it's not. And if God has blessed you that way, praise God. That's wonderful. I mean, that's awesome. But that's not true of everybody. So in these passages, what we do is we look at the God of this circumstance rather than the circumstance itself. The fact that God would be kind to anyone this way the fact that anyone would be able to experience this is beyond belief. And by the way, just because you don't experience it now doesn't mean you won't. Because what God has promised for you as his child is far better than houses full of gold. I mean, where we're going, gold is so remedial, we will walk on it. Wealth and riches are in his house. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He's gracious and merciful and righteous. Promise. This is who he is. He's grace, gracious and merciful and righteous. The effect is not a one size fit all, but the promise is. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends and who, who conducts his affairs with justice. So the wise man is not only prosperous, but he's generous. And it's important that you see that. The wise man is not only prosperous, but he's generous, especially those whom God has especially prospered. These are aspects of the promise in Deuteronomy 28. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. It sounds so much like this. Verse 2, the generation of the upright will be blessed. This is Deuteronomy 6, 28, verse 3 to 6. And the crops of your land and the young, your livestock, the calves of your herd, the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you, when you come in and you'll be blessed when you go out. God blesses those who walk in the way of wisdom. We just get in trouble when we begin to define what blessing is and anything outside that definition is not blessing. You understand what I'm saying? When I get to say, I feel blessed when, and then I get to say, God, here's when I feel blessed and if you don't, then I don't feel blessed. And what it is, maybe it's not money for you. Maybe it's just time. Maybe you're just like, if I could have, you know, 15 weeks of vacation all paid for, like I'd feel blessed, which I guess is money, right? But you understand what I'm saying? Whatever it is for you, we don't get to define all of this. What God has done, gener what God has done in his covenant and then ratified Eternally in redemption is beyond generous. I mean, there's no words for that kind of generosity. It's very specific, by the way. It actually says that God will specifically honor those who charge, who, who are generous without charging interest. It, it's, so, it's so fascinating that, and this is a concept we see in Proverbs as well, by the way. It's so fascinating that God has accounted for even these details. But those to whom God has been generous are generous. Those who experience the, the blessing in this way of walking in the way of wisdom are to be a giving people. And to a certain extent, then, we're all to be giving people. And I don't know what your resources are that you have to give. That's up for you to figure out. It's not always money. I, I think sometimes we reduce, especially when we talk, start talking about spiritual gifts and we say, my spiritual gift isn't giving because I'm not really rich. It's like... Well, if that's all you think giving is, then I can see why you wouldn't give, right? But what about your time? I mean, we live in a, we live in a world where, where people's time is as, seems as precious as their money. And they, they protect it just as much as their money. We're all too busy. We've all got a lot going on. And just trying to fit you in is hard. Like, that's a bad way to live. It's not a good way to live. 
your, your home, having people into your home just to hang out and talk and, and making a few desserts. Well, I'm not a good cook. Rise and Roll does a great job. Like, what do you have to give? Because, because God has been so generous to all of us. And just because it's not gold and crops, right? In a context like ours, many people could give their crops. We've gotten crops from people in our church. But you get my point. What is it? If we reduce our view of God's blessing, we will also reduce our definitions of generosity. So you note this prosperity is not a selfish prosperity. And here, that, that's the difference. We're going to talk about this prosperity versus what Joel Osteen teaches or, you know, these other guys. Um, I always forget the guy up in Michigan who's a whack job. But um, there's a guy right up there. You know, he's got the jets. Anyway, I can't remember his name. Um, the, the difference is that they're going to teach this so that you can get and you can be happy and, you know. But this is so that you can... You can actually disperse. You can give out. And you can give God the glory for it rather than just receiving the gain and being happy and satisfied in the gain. The second blessing or benefit of walking the way of wisdom is first of all a godly, so firstly it's, it's a godly prosperity that results in worship and generosity not just receiving gain for selfishness. But the second direct benefit of walking the way of wisdom is security. Verses 6 through 8, For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. What a verse. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. Security. For the righteous will never be moved. That is, they're secured, they're settled. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. I want to park and just, by way of application, verse 7 there for just a moment. I think verse 7 is especially helpful in a world where um, literally, literally, uh, bad news, there's a, there's a massive market for bad news. And when I say that, I mean bad news makes a lot of money. Market, news media, social media outlets thrive on, on news that causes fear. And if any, any questions about that, just study 2020 to 2022 and this little thing we had called COVID, right? Now, obviously, we can oversimplify a lot of things there, but it was pretty obvious that it doesn't take a lot to cause an entire world to live in fear. An entire, I mean, you think about that. The entire world was affected by the same thing. And it just takes a market stoking that, that fire. And, and when I joke about not watching the news too much, I'm really not joking. If you can't watch the news without anxiety, you shouldn't do it. I think I told you, I think I've said this, I had a pastor, a pastor one time tell me, I didn't know this guy very well, but my parents did, and we bumped into each other at a bakery. I was just about to graduate from school, and I told him, you know, I love preaching. Um, I really struggle with application. I really don't feel like I'm good at applying, if you have any insight on that. I especially struggle with older people. And he said, preach on the news in fear, because that's, that's what they're struggling with. That's what older people are struggling with, is fear, and they're watching the news too much. And I was like, well, that seems, you know, in my very foolish young person mind, well, that seems a little bit oversimplistic, right? Um, but he's not wrong. 
He's not wrong. Because there's a market for bad news, and we live in a world where bad news sells. The man who walks in the way of wisdom is not afraid of bad news. Do you see that? I mean, what a practical verse. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. How can you not be afraid of bad news? Trusting in the Lord. So, uh, not to be overly personal, but some of you have asked, I had a minor operation done on my head last week, okay? Uh, I, had a, I had a tumor that was growing, and it was growing at a rate that alarmed my doctor, right? Um, and uh, so he said, you know, we're pretty sure it's nothing to worry about, which is like, thank you, right? <laughs> uh, and... So I was like, yeah, we'll get it cut out and we'll not worry about it. And I legitimately had those. Okay, you're like, what if this is really bad? You know? We've got a friend. We, went to, we worked at camp with her. She's, my wife grew up with her. She's 31, so she's a year older than me. And she's got brain cancer. And they found it too late. And she's doing everything she wants to do before she dies now. And I legitimately had those, like, all right, what if this is bad? I got family. I got young family. And, and I can, like, it got to the point where it's was like, you know what? We're, we're, gonna, we're not going to worry. Bad news is bad news. And if it comes, God is God's okay. Like, we're okay. God is good. Now, it turns out it was nothing, like we thought it would be. But you all know that feeling of going, all right, well, this, who knows what's going to come out of this? Everyone's faced that in life. Maybe you're there right now. Like, who's not, who knows what's going to come out of this? There's potential here for something scary. You walk in the way of wisdom, and you can face those situations trusting and with little fear. His heart is steady. It's not wavering. Literally, it means stable. It's, you know, it, it's, not like, it's not like the table that you sit down at the restaurant where one of the legs is shorter than the others, right? It's not rickety. It's stable. It's steady. It's not insecure. Literally, the idea is, you know, when something's shaking, it's not secured. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. God gives him victory. God blesses him with victory. So how can we face this life? Remember, as I said from the beginning, this way of wisdom, it's got guardrails, it's got parameters. It really is the only safe way. And that's made especially apparent by the conclusion where the psalmist contrasts two consequences. So note with me finally, verses 9 and 10. Contrasting consequences. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. So the blessed man, or the happy man, the man walking in wisdom, he's given, this is a, a, a summary. I mean, essentially a summary of the psalm. He's generous, and his righteousness endures forever. There's security, there's stability. His horn is exalted in honor. There's victory. Contrast. And it's so fascinating, this is how it ends. But it ends in a warning. It seems like it should end like Psalm 111, verse 10. His praise endures forever, but it doesn't. It ends with a warning. Why? Because the primary uh, focus of the psalm is one of wisdom. His heart, excuse me, the wicked man sees it, that is the prosperity and security of the wise man, and gnashes his teeth and melts away. It makes wicked people angry when spiritual people are secure. Again, if you question that, just look at culture and see how typically hated faithful Christ followers are becoming. Or look at the first century. 
The desire of the wicked will perish. This desire or covetousness of the wicked will perish. So you set these two against each other. The wise man has received all he needs. He's received enough to be generous and give back. And he's received security from the Lord. And he's re- there, there's actually legacy here. His horn is exalted in honor. His righteousness endures forever because he's, he's maintained that safety because of the, the, he's stayed on the way with, with, with the guardrails and, and, and the markers of, of, of progress in contrast to the wicked man who will perish. And note the primary aspect of the wicked man or the primary sin of the wicked man in verse 10 is his greed, which makes perfect logical sense that what we have seen in the entire passage is that the way of wisdom brings the provision of God. The way of the foolish is outside that provision, so they have to get gained their own way. Calvin has a fascinating quote on this verse. That the covetous wants that which he has as well as that which he has not because he is the master of nothing yet slave to his own wealth. The desire of the wicked will perish but God keeps and provides and secures those who walk in the way of the wise. I believe the song could be summarized very simply this way. The path of wisdom arrives at peace. The path of wisdom arrives at peace. And I say that both with considerations of this life but understanding its fullness is realized in the next. We don't have the we don't have the peace of we don't have the, the excuse me we don't have the the worry and fear of lack and of troubling circumstances and instability and insecurity in this life because of the way of wisdom assures we know God's provision we know God's abundance of grace His steadfast love the way of wisdom provides security it's got guardrails it keeps us on the path. We can face life, even if there's bad news on the horizon, trusting the Lord with a firm heart. And we can be certain that these things assure what God has promised to his people. That when we stay in this way, we arrive at the life that he intended, which is a life of peace with him. Which, if you think about it from terms of Old, Old Testament, that's what, they, that's what they wanted, right? Shalom. Peace. Life the way it should be. The life that God has provided for those that are His. And so, loved ones, walk in the way of wisdom. Know the security. Know the biblical and godly form of prosperity and teach it. May the way of wisdom be relevant in our parenting, be relevant in our discipling. We want to keep our kids safe, our younger brothers and sisters in Christ safe, our grandchildren safe as we possibly can, understanding their wills and all those things. We teach the way of wisdom. What Grace Bible Church really needs is an entire multi-generational congregation of people taking the road less traveled so that we arrive at peace together. Let's pray.